This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 389, recorded on February 3rd, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free. If you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. I'm speaking today with Professor Stan Lemon from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome to TWIV, Stan. Thank you, Vince. It's good but, to be here. Actually, welcome back, because you were on TWIV in our episode from... Um, what was it, Edmonton? Live from Edmonton. Uh, that was yeah. like a, a symposium of some kind. It's right? one that, uh, yeah, that Lauren Terrell had That's put right. together. Yep. And you talked about enveloped hepatitis A virus there. Mm -hmm. And we also had a pox virus person on the panel, and and I can't remember who else. Um, but that was a lot of fun. But you're here giving a seminar in my department. I invited you, actually. I am. <laughs> you've just arrived. <laughs> you've just flown in. And I grabbed him and I said, can I record a podcast? And he said yes, because he's an agreeable guy. Who has yeah, no and we avoided years. the snow today. It's warm. Was it supposed to snow? No, rain. But, you know, you've had snow lately. And we did. Two weeks ago, we had snow. I, was, I wasn't here. I was in Pittsburgh. And I got stuck there. Mm -hmm. It took me a whole day. It took me almost 18 hours to take the train from Pittsburgh to New York City. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible, but that's when I was visiting Julius Youngner. So I thought we have at least an hour. It's ten thirty. Your seminar's at noon. We have an hour, an hour and a quarter. So we wow. can do all kinds of talking about what you do. We can really bore your audience. We can talk about Zika too. Zika. Do you yeah. think about Zika at all? I don't think much about it. I mean, I do think about it a little bit, but uh, I don't know much about it. You must know Helen Lazier, right? Sure. She's in your department. She's right above me now. And we're she's going to be on Twiv Friday. Yeah. We're going to talk all about Zika and nothing else. That'll be fun. Yeah. We actually had a, a mini symposium on Zika uh, yeah. last Friday at mm -hmm. UNC, um, and Helen gave her cool her story. Yeah, hopefully she'll do it again on TWIV, because I think there's a lot of misconception out there in the press, and uh, we'd like to sort it out. There are no answers yet, but mm -hmm. I'd like to sort it out. But we'll talk about your work today. I want to start in the be from the very beginning, because I don't think I've ever done that with you. Oh, my gosh. Where, where are you from originally? Uh, from Boston. Really? Yeah. Born Grew there up in, in Weymouth, just south of Boston. Uh -huh. you, you went to high school there as well? Went to high school out in Omaha. My dad was at BU and took a job out at uh, wow. the cancer center in Omaha when I was a uh, sophomore in high school. What kind of uh, work did he do? He was a uh, breast cancer clinical oncologist. Yeah. Uh, he was very interested in the hormonal control of breast cancer in women, mm -hmm. estrogens. And is that why you eventually got an MD? Uh, in part, maybe? Well, possibly. I mean, he was certainly an example, but, uh, mm. you know, unlike me, he was someone who spent his life seeing patients and helping patients. Right. right. But you wanted to do research, And right? I was more skewed to the research end. I did clinical work for a long time, too. Mm -hmm. Not so lately. I have your CV in front of me, so I'm cheating. So you went yeah, to Princeton. I did. And um, Very lucky there to work with Max Berger. I don't know Max Berger. Max was very interested in cell surface determinants and differentiation and mm -hmm. development. Uh, and uh, we studied the aggregation of sponge cells. Ah, interesting. So, Did you know um, John Bonner? He's no. the slime mold guy from Princeton. Yeah, I know the name. He used to teach Biology 101. And uh, after he retired, they let him have an office and be a resource, mm -hmm. which you probably know at medical schools you can't do. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> but here, certainly, they can't do it. If I wanted to stay here, I'd have to pay rent. I'd have to cool. pay rent for my office. Um, and you majored in biochemical sciences. Yeah. Now, all the people we know at Princeton today were not there, right? None of them. Like, and none of the buildings were there. I mean... The uh, Lewis Thomas building wasn't there. Arthur right? Pardee was in the Department of Biology at eh, that time. Right. And... Uh, um, 
It was a very different place. So Tom Shank wasn't there, Lynn Enquist no. wasn't there, None Dane Flint, nope. um, Bonnie Bassler, many, many other people. Maybe This was a long time ago. There's a phage guy who's there, um, whose name is escaping me. Uh, He's still there, in fact. Yeah. I, I can't remember his name, but you might have known him. Um, but through, well, as you were going through Princeton, was medical school in your uh, plans? Uh, it was. Mm-hmm. So you applied and I always in. was interested in medical school. So I was pre-med uh, at the start. Ended up going to the University of Rochester, mm-hmm. which for me was a good fit. And uh, got interested in infectious diseases probably during that period of time. So you must have done well in Princeton, right? You could, uh, you did could okay. Student. I got into medical school. Yeah. That's what counts. What, do you think it was easier then than it is now? I'm sure it was easier <laughs> to get in than it is now. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. want to have to go through that again. But, you know, I, I visited Princeton recently and... Uh, just walking around the campus, it made me think, you know, there were so many things I could have done when I was there. Mm. If I knew now what I, yeah, you know, if and I knew all, then what I knew now. We all feel that way, yeah. right? Right. We all think we, I, I think, I went to Cornell and I think I didn't take advantage of anything. No, I agree. Right. For me. So why did you pick Rochester? You like snow? I got in there. You got in. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, it was a good school. I liked the curriculum. And you, did, while you were a medical student, did you have any opportunity to, to do research or was it all... Just medical school. I did some summer uh, research uh, yeah. with Alex Reeves, uh, who was a neurologist who mm-hmm. ended up, I think, going to Dartmouth. Um, and I was in a uh, an army program at that time, an early commissioning program, trying to stay out of Vietnam. <laughs> so I, I got to go out to Letterman, the Army Institute uh-huh. of Research, one summer and work on lipase assays. Uh-huh. Why the army was interested in that, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, not much. No real serious research, okay. certainly. So after medical school, you did the usual internships and residency? Yeah, I, I went into a, uh, a mixed med-peds residency mm-hmm. uh, internship. And there's only three of those in the country at the time. Chapel Hill was one. Mm. Uh, Yale was one. Col- I think Colorado was the other. And of the three, I liked Chapel Hill best. So You went there. That was w- the first time. So were you thinking at that point of having a traditional clinical career? I was, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I liked academic medicine, um, but I was thinking that I would be probably seeing patients uh, yeah. for a long time, for probably, probably the first 10 years after I graduated, I was sort of torn between private practice and uh, academic practice. Mm-hmm. My wife really wanted to turn return to the Northeast, to Maine, where mm-hmm. she lives. Mm-hmm. I actually got my license in Maine at one point, thinking <laughs> I might do it. But, you know, in retrospect, I'm really glad I didn't because I've had a career that's much more varied yeah. and it's been much more interesting, I think, than it would have been if I'd done that. So what point did you make the decision to do research? Well, I, and the um, Infectious Disease Fellowship at that time historically was really research-oriented. Okay. Yeah, so it's a two-year fellowship, but it was only six months on the wards. Mm-hmm. And I was fortunate enough to end up with Joe Pagano right. as a mentor. Um, Fred Sparling, whom you may know, is yes, a GC did. guy. He yep. was the uh, head of the division at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, John Spitznagel was in the department. Uh, he was a poly guy, polymorphonuclear leukocyte guy. Mm-hmm. So it was very much a, uh, very research oriented, uh, division. And it was one that had a, a very seamless relationship with the department of microbiology and immunology. Mm-hmm. I saw looking at your CV. I see you published with Joe Pagano on Epstein bar virus. My first paper. A first nature, real paper. A nature paper. A nature paper. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it was about growing the virus in lymphocytes. No, that paper was about identifying the viral genome in okay. epithelial cells right. in the mouth. Right. Okay. The, the portal, portal yeah. of entry, presumably. And uh, that was interesting in retrospect. I mean, we did it by in situ hybridization. Mm-hmm. These were before we had plasmids. Yeah. And what did you use as a probe? So then? there was a guy in uh, in Joe's lab, I think it was Jim Shaw, who spent all his time making polymerase because he couldn't buy it from right. Pomega. Right. And, and we make... purified virus uh-huh. from cells and then transcribed RNA, an RNA probe from viral DNA. Right. And then used that to hybridize on glass slides, yeah, yeah. dipped them in an emulsion, mm-hmm. put them in the freezer for <laughs> six weeks. <laughs> It was quite amazing. Uh, I think no one believed it for about two years mm. until John Sixby was able to reproduce it. Yeah. And now, of course, we know EBV infects epithelial cells in the oropharynx. Right. Well, and Joe is still active. Joe is still very much active. So here you yes, are. Indeed. You're back at UNC as a professor. and My mentor is. is still there. <laughs> do, you, do you ever see him and talk to him? <laughs> I, see, I see Joe quite a bit. His wife and my wife are good friends. Yeah, uh, it's and, amazing. Uh, yeah. And on the last twit, we just did a, a paper, which I find amazing about the connection between EBV 
uh, plasmodium and Bur- endemic Burkitt's lymphoma. Mm. I don't know if you know this story. It just came out recently, but it turns out there's always been a strong epidemiological yeah, right. association between malaria yeah. and endemic burden. And geospatial, geographic spatial yes, relationship exactly. also, altitude and so forth. It turns out that um, <laughs> infection with plasmodium upregulates uh, activation-induced cytidine deaminase, a- AID, mm-hmm. the hypermutating enzyme, and that hypermutates C-MYC, which yeah. gets translocated into the immunoglobulin locus, and then Epstein-Barr virus immortalizes the cells so they don't die, and that leads to a tumor. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And it was, you know, <laughs> because EBV was only discovered, what, in the 50s, I think, or 60s, probably? Yeah, I forget when that work was actually done. So I was, my fellowship with Joe was um, 75 to 77. Yeah. So, um, you know, and Joe had been working on it with Noniyama previously, um, it was a good lab. Mary Estes had left the lab just before I mm-hmm. joined it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I didn't know you trained time. with Joe. She I think she was a graduate student. Wow, how about that? So after your ID fellowship, what did you do next? I had a commitment to the U.S. Army. Ah. So uh, it was uh, either a general infectious disease mm-hmm. officer's position in law school, Germany, mm-hmm. you know, or I had an opportunity to go to Walter Reed. And uh, I was lucky enough to get an appointment at the Army Institute of Research at mm-hmm. Walter Reed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there, of course, the Army had you know not a whole lot of interest in Epstein-Barr virus, <laughs> maybe no interest. But they were quite interested in hepatitis A, right. uh, which had just been discovered a year or two before by Bob Purcell and uh, Al Kapikian and Steve Feinstone. Uh, so my first task was to uh, learn how to subtype hepatitis B by octolone mm-hmm, assays, mm-hmm. and uh, to develop some preliminary assays for hepatitis A. Right. And the Army had a ton of reagents, mostly uh, freezers full of fecal material from yeah. previous studies. Huh. I, uh, I didn't know that's how you got into hep A. That's how I got into hep A. Which is what yeah. you're going to talk about today. So you've worked am. on it your yeah. entire career, right? Well, I worked on it uh, pretty intensively up until the 90s. And yeah. then, you know, hepatitis C came along and right. had a detour with hepatitis C for the past two decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we've come back to hepatitis A over the past five years or so. Right. And it's great. It's a virus that keeps giving. I remember you telling me one. We, we used to spend a lot of time in Geneva. In Geneva, we did. With WHO. I remember those walks along the, uh, the lake, the right? Lake. Yeah. You'd explain all the sailboats and the wind and everything because you like to sail, right? Yeah. And uh, you said, Hep A needs more people. You should do it. I remember you telling me. And also at an airport, we were coming back from a meeting and you, you said you should work on Hep A. Because there's a lot to be done, and uh, well, we sent <laughs> we've sent Hep A to a lot of polio virologists yeah, over the year, yeah. you know, but but very few have actually taken it out. <clears throat> I think Ellie Ellie Ehrenfeld was the only one mm. really that has done it, that did it and embraced it. Well, I had a postdoc who who works on Hep A, Arado Kaplan. He's, yeah, he's at the sure. FDA, yeah. so he does it. So at least I contributed to the you field, did. the receptor. How long were you um, at the at Walter Reed? So I was at Rare uh, for. Six years, wow. 77 to 83. Uh, and I was actually, at that time, uh, thinking about staying in the Army because mm-hmm. it, was, it, was, it was interesting. Uh, and I was offered the uh, position of being head of the lab in Bangkok. The Army's got half a dozen, or did at the time, half a dozen overseas mm-hmm. virology laboratories. So the lab in Bangkok, uh, Don Burke had been uh, managing that lab. Right. It had a long history of working with dengue. Uh, and JE and uh, vaccine field trials. Mm. Back, one of the hepatitis A vaccine field trials was done in Bangkok. Uh, Bruce Innes out of that uh, that uh, lab. So that's where I was heading. We we're actually going downtown to the State Department, starting taking some Thai lessons and so forth. <laughs> and then I got uh, a call from Chapel Hill that they want to come back, take a look at a job there in the yeah. division. So. That's what I did. So you went back to Chapel Hill, and did you have an appointment in microbiology then? I had a joint appointment, yeah. as I do now. I was appointed primarily in medicine. Um, I was head of the Division of Infectious Diseases. I took over from Fred, mm-hmm, who right. had move, moved on to become chairman of microbiology at that time. Mm-hmm. So you are there for over 10 years, right? Uh, about 14 years. 14 years. I remember those years. That's when I first got to know you, and you were working mainly on Hep A during that time. Hep A, right? yeah, pretty much exclusively. Yeah, uh, and then you moved to Texas. I did to Galveston. Galveston. I remember talking to you on the phone about it before I did. <laughs> really? And you were saying, "Why do you want to go to Galveston? <laughs> Why do you want to leave UNC?" 
Um, and, and for me at that time, um, you know, I was finding myself split between clinical medicine because yeah. I was still doing clinical medicine and uh, teaching, holding rounds and ID and so forth. I wasn't division chief anymore. I was associate chairman of the Department of Medicine at that time. But, you know, doing that and then also trying to compete with guys like you <laughs> at NIH for our, you know, for our one funding, yeah. I felt I was being stretched. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was too thin, so I decided to really focus on the science side. And I was offered the, uh, the chair position down at uh, Galveston mm -hmm. at UTMB. Mm -hmm. So That lets you do more research, right? It's entirely research and research no, administration. No clinical responsibilities. No clinical there. responsibilities. I had a secondary appointment in the Department of Medicine there. So that worked real well for about a year until Jack Stobo asked me to be uh, dean ad interim. Ah, interim dean. Okay, yeah. but that lasted for what four years or so. Well, I became permanent dean, <laughs> and then I was managing, you know, the clinical practice. Right. So right. I, Not what I you was wanted. Back in it. it wasn't what I what I really wanted. Okay. Uh, but I but I really enjoyed being dean. I mean, it was uh, there's a lot of uh, you know secondary rewards you get by being dean, and you can do things that you think are important. You can help people. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, graduate students stop knocking on your door, asking right. for rotations and, right. you know, yeah, uh, your I grants slowly start falling off. So <laughs> I did it for five years and decided to get back into the But having a, lab. having a dean who is a virologist would be spectacular because you would clearly have an appreciation for basic research, which not all deans have, right? Yeah, well, many do, uh, but there aren't many that have come through that path, I think. Yeah. 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 We, we have not had a microbiologist or basic research scientist as a dean here for many, many years. And I, I here, at least at Columbia, I think basic research kind of gets neglected. We don't raise as much money as, as clinical people do. Yeah. However, I think all the, my vision is, my view is that the discoveries made by basic scientists are the ones that eventually get into the clinic and are used, yeah. right? Well, well, also the reputation of the basic science departments will fuel yeah. the clinical <clears throat> enterprise of an institution. Right. Now, I remember you, you're a sailor, right? And you have a I boat. am. So when you went from uh, Chapel Hill to, um, he's going to show me a picture, I'm sure. <laughs> when you went from Chapel Hill to Galveston, did you take your boat with you? No, I sold it at the time. I was, okay. um, it, it was a 30-foot boat, and I thought it was a little bit uh, small for... The Gulf. The Gulf. Yeah. And, you know, the Gulf's pretty uh, scary place. Is it, but you used to go into the Atlantic off of North uh, Carolina. We used to do most of our sailing in the Sound. Sound, okay. And I also, I didn't have that much time. I was pretty busy. Yeah, right. Uh, but, uh, I remember you explaining to me all about GPS, which was just uh, coming on, and how you could get to within three meters of where you wanted to go. You can right? do all that, yeah. <laughs> so here we are actually last Tuesday. So you can sail in North Carolina in January. Yeah. It's <laughs> well, we have an ID doc here who dan griffin who's on my, one of my podcasts and he's still sailing now he says as long as it, the weather's okay you can sail in the cold that's a beautiful boat yeah, it is it's almost 40 years old wow the, what's the name of it hep the, a the name of the boat is flirt 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 f-l-i-r-t -L it's not an acronym for anything no it? a flirt uh, you know what a flirt is, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. But, uh, <laughs> flirt is the name of one of the Navy boats, the 44-foot looters I that see. the Navy Academy used to have. And a flirt also is a faint puff of wind. Mm -hmm. A flirt of okay. wind. So so that is uh, in North Carolina, the photo you showed. Mm -hmm. So you bought another boat when you went back. I did. I guess. Yeah. And is that one of the reasons you went back also because you could sail again? Uh, that was one of the reasons. Yeah. Uh, there were, there were a number of reasons. Well, other one, of course, that you yeah. wanted to do research again, right? I, I think the big part of it, the biggest part of yeah. it, was just the opportunity to get back to the UNC uh, environment. That was in 2010 when you went back and... And to get out of running a BSL-4 lab. At Galveston, Which yeah. is what I was doing at Galveston at the time, the wow. national lab, yeah, which was yeah. not really congruent with my you know, mm -hmm. research interests. Yeah, HEP-A and HEP-C, you don't need a BSL-4 no. to, no. to work on. <laughs> so when you went to Galveston, that's when you got into HEP-C, is that correct? Uh, no, we were working on Hep C in, in North uh, Carolina before that. Um, you know, we made the entry into Hepatitis C through the iris. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we ended up doing with Hepatitis A was mapping the iris, um, mapping the secondary structure of the five prime right. untranslated region. Right. And then when people, um, I think it was Sukiyama in Akio's lab, mm -hmm. recognized that Hepatitis C had an iris also, right. it was sort of a natural thing to shift over and look at some of the cell factors that right. are involved in iris. Right translation of hep C and, and actually my hep C work is still 
uh, related to that area. And to the IRS. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're continuing to do hep C, but yeah. mostly hep A nowadays? Uh, 50-50. Okay. Cause yeah. I, so you have so many cool discoveries over the years of looking at your summary. You know, the new biosketch format of NIH grants is really quite nice because you can make a nice yeah. summary. And people often send it to me. Uh, so last year at ASV, I introduced Joan Stites uh-huh. my keynote. She said, this is really a great summary that uh, you can have because it's it's succinct. You can only put a few publications right. in each one. And you have to highlight you know, four or five areas yeah. where you think you made a contribution. And you've made many. So you have both Hep C and Hep Well, the people in my lab have. I can't claim to have done oh, much about myself. Yeah, they do the work, but you have also directed them and acquired funding. So you played a little role as well. Uh, but you started with Hep A. And I remember in the old days, you were trying to figure out how to quantify virus. You, mm-hmm. did, you couldn't do a plaque assay, right? So Stanley is sitting in front of the wall right now of polio. And you're, you may be somewhat jealous that the polio forms such nice plaques, right? <laughs> Well, actually, you know, uh, there are strains of Hep A, uh, cell culture adapted strains that are cytopathic. That, right, I that actually those. you can plaque. Right. Uh, but the moon has to be in the correct phase. Oh, it's not. It's and, not uh, uh, straightforward, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's a sometime thing. But we developed a uh, method that is very much like a plaque. It's done under an agarose overlay, yeah, but right. we peel the agarose off, and we use the Lux Permanox dishes. Mm-hmm which are resistant to acetone um, fixation and fix the cells. And then we labeled the cells with an iodinated antibody, right. polyclonal human antibody. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, uh, with appropriate blocking and so forth to develop them and saw these beautiful plaques. I remember foci. that well. It's basically an autoradiograph. Of radio a, immunofoci. Radio immunofocus. Yeah. So you use it to quantify. And we still use it, but we use it now uh, with an infrared probe. Mm-hmm. Infrared fluorescent probe, so we can now uh, look at these uh, foci in our Odyssey imager. So you, you continue to use that for most strains yeah. because you don't always work with when we do that. titrations. Yeah, which is because we're more interested now, of course, in the low passage non cytopathic viruses in terms of how they acquire this envelope right. and get right. out of the cell. So, in terms of disease burden globally, what, where does hepatitis A virus stand? Vanishingly low. <laughs> um, in the U.S. and probably elsewhere. I mean, there was a recent article, I think in Nature, that yeah. compared disease burden mm-hmm. with funding. And I was quite amazed that Hep A made it in both, <laughs> yeah. you know, that there actually was enough funding yeah. to quantify it and disease. So it, in the U.S. Uh, today, uh, it still accounts for uh, more deaths than anthrax, certainly, you know, probably 100 deaths a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the numbers of reported cases, uh, it's really low, less than 10,000, I think, uh, quite is, a bit less than 10,000. Is it 10, a notifiable disease? By it is a notifiable disease, okay. and, and many are not notified. But, yeah. So the, the overall estimated burden, I think, is probably somewhere around twenty to maybe 30,000 cases, if that. Mm-hmm. Um, the, um, and compared to you know years past before the vaccine when it was hundreds of thousands of cases. Although it, it still is a cause, a frequent cause of foodborne outbreaks. Mm-hmm. Imported food stuff in the U.S. The uh, you know the famous Taco Bell outbreak right. in Pittsburgh, right. six hundred cases, three deaths. Those three deaths, I think, were all middle-aged men, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it can be a uh, serious infection, and it can cause a serious public health disruption because most people in the U.S. are susceptible to it. So when I was going to Brazil a couple of years ago, with my physician suggested I get a Hep A vaccine. I would hope you would. So yeah. certain places in the world. Uh, you're at risk. Why is that? Is, there, is that from the food there or? Sanitation. Sanitation. I mean, this is a virus that's very stable in the mm-hmm. environment, much more stable than polio. Uh, so it can li- it can last in water. It can dry. Th- those those um, Lux Permanox tissue mm-hmm. culture sheets fixed with acetone. Mm-hmm. We used to stack them up in the lab. Okay. Mm-hmm. It was like paper sheets. So they weren't yeah. as impressive yeah. as your wall. Right. <laughs> but we went back to one of those, um, I think two months after we had put it up on a shelf. Yeah. And we scraped the dried cells. And you got infectivity. And we got infected. Wow. <laughs> the wall behind you of polio, I don't think. Yeah. Those are treated with 20% TCA yeah. to fix the cells to the plastic so they don't come off when you then stain it. But the crystal violet stain has methanol and ethanol, or just ethanol in it. I don't think there's any polio infectivity. People always ask me that. Um, uh, you, uh, hep A would probably withstand that. don't know about polio. The ethanol TCA. would dry it. Yeah. You know. We should try it sometime. 
Um, someone was TCA wouldn't wouldn't touch it. I really? Think. Yeah. I don't know, twenty percent or ten percent. It's a lot. No, uh, it's said to be stable down to pH one. Yeah. I don't know if I believe that or not. We've never tested it that low. Hep A, you mean? Hep A, yeah. So the vaccine that's available is a is an attenuated infectious vaccine, is that correct? Uh, it's a formal inactivated formal inactivated type vaccine. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of effort in the 80s and 90s to make an attenuated vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was when you adapted it to cell culture, it became attenuated, but it became also uh, very poorly immunogenic. It just didn't replicate. So there was never, mm. um, never a strain developed that had altered tropism. If you think Sabin strains work because they're not neurotropic, yeah, yeah, they replicate in the gut. Okay. I think it's still really questionable whether hepatitis A actually replicates in the gut. In fact, the data we have would suggest it doesn't. Mm. So you think you ingest it, contaminated food or water, it goes, and then it has to make its way to the liver, right? It may cross through the M cells. Yeah. Um, there may be small foci of replication, but it's certainly not a major thing. Is there an animal model that you would use to I'm study? I'm going to talk that? about it today. You're going to yeah. talk about it's it It's a new one. Okay. Not published yet. And um, so the, the use of this vaccine in the U.S. and, and elsewhere has is, is reduced infection. Yeah, it's, it's really quite interesting. I mean, it was used uh, first for travelers and mm -hmm. people at high risk, um, and then... I think about 15 years ago, maybe not quite that much, the CDC became concerned that the um, incidence of hepatitis A was really high in the southwestern United States, mm -hmm. uh, along the Mexican border and mm -hmm. on up into mm -hmm. California. So they began recommending uh, programs of universal childhood immunization in that part of the country. And within a couple of years, those states had much lower rates of hepatitis nice. in the adults yeah. as well as the kids, right. lower than other parts of the country. So that led to recommendations for uniform, universal mm -hmm. childhood immunization. And, and now that's quite common in many parts of the world. Uh, I was surprised to see that in Beijing, for example, mm -hmm. school children get a hepatitis A vaccine. Yeah. It's interesting. Here, here it's not one of the childhood required vaccines, right? It's given. It's, it, it, it's not required as far as I know by anyone, yeah. uh, but it's often given. Yeah, as, recommended. As, as well as the Hep B, right? Mm -hmm. For new for, for is that there is a uh, combined formulation. Hep A and B. Hep A yeah. and B. Interesting. So the pathogenesis is that somehow from the gut it gets to the liver, right? Through the through the blood, I presume, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just tropic for the liver; it doesn't replicate anywhere else. The data we have suggests it replicates only in the liver. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's only in hepatocytes or whether it's replicating also in macrophage within the liver, mm -hmm. I think it's probably only in hepatocytes. Okay, and then destruction of cells leads to the jaundice and symptoms of mostly uh, it's a it's an immune attack. And mm -hmm. The data we have now, which I'm going to talk about today, suggests it's probably a um, MAVs and ERF three mediated apoptosis that's primarily responsible. But then you get recruitment of all kinds of inflammatory cells into the mm -hmm. liver. So, in an infected liver, do you get foci of cell? destruction or exactly. is it diffuse it's not diffuse yeah. you see what well, you see are diffuse foci scattered around, around. the liver of um, uh, necro inflammatory uh, responses um, you see dying hepatocytes you mm -hmm. see apoptotic hepatocytes mm -hmm. with infiltrates periportal uh, as well as in the parenchyma so if you acquired hepe what would you what would you be feeling badly <laughs> Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, so the incubation period is quite long, mm -hmm. you know, maybe four weeks, three to five weeks based on your dose probably. Uh, and one of the first things that might happen is you may start having some fever. Uh, if you smoke, you'll lose taste for cigarettes. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. You'll find your urine becomes quite dark mm -hmm. and your stool becomes clay colored. And if you look at your the whites of your eyes, they may not be white any longer. They'll turn yellow. So about 50% of adults, when they're infected, you know, develop frank jaundice uh -huh. uh, and um, right upper quadrant pain where the liver is enlarged and inflamed. Right. And so you would go to a physician. It could easily be diagnosed, but it would be they wouldn't do anything for you. Well, they'd look at you and they'd say, wow, my gosh, this guy's got hepatitis. But they wouldn't know whether it was hepatitis A yeah. or B <laughs> or C or D mm -hmm. or E. Uh, and uh, so you'd have to do tests. And even if they did find out it was Hep A, they would say, okay, you'll be fine in a few You'll months. be fine, yeah. Because most of the infections are self-resolving, right? Right. This episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. It's founded by John Hendricks, the founder of Discovery Communications. You'll find there over 1,400 titles, 
and 600 hours of content. It's available in 196 countries worldwide, and here on TWIV, we reach most of those countries, so you, you're able to get it. And the streaming is available on many platforms. You can stream on a web app, on Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. Now, what do they have at Curiosity Stream? A wide variety of science and technology content, which our listeners will probably like, but also nature, history, and many other topics as well. You'll also find over 50 hours of 4K content, which they've just you know, launched, and of course, they're building to make that library even bigger. In addition to documentaries, they also have interviews and lectures. For example, Stephen Hawking's Universe. Stephen Hawking's Traces the History of Astronomical Theories and Technology. Next World featuring Michio Kaku talking about the future of technology, virtual reality, AI, and other technological questions. They even have some programs on viruses. One of them is called Viruses Destruction and Creation, where they talk about Zika virus, of course. Life on Earth, a series that explores biodiversity of our bodies, and many, many others. With Curiosity Stream, you get real science shows and not just reality TV science shows like the ones plaguing cable TV. There are monthly and annual plans available, and the plans start at just $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee or the cost of one title on competing on-demand platforms. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at startup. <laughs> And use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIV. Now, do you only acquire it from humans or their animal reservoirs of infection? Um, the infection is only acquired from humans. Okay. Uh, the virus has only been identified in humans or in higher primates. I mean, if you're a primate handler mm -hmm. working with monkeys, you might get it from a monkey colony, but, but the monkeys are likely to be infected with a human strain. Um, uh, but so for many years, uh, it was thought to be a virus that could only replicate in primates, humans, and other higher primates. And many early studies failed to show it was capable of infecting a whole wide variety of rodents. Right. <laughs> um, there were one or two papers that suggested that maybe guinea pigs uh -huh. would have a little bit of replication, but nothing, no disease, and minimal uh, evidence for replication. And then this guy, Felix Drexler, at the University of Bonn, whom we've been collaborating with over the past year, did this really amazing study, and I'm not sure exactly what prompted him to do it, but <laughs> he had a collection of about 15,000 samples from all around the world mm -hmm. uh, that were um, uh, specimens of uh, guano from bats, uh, droppings from hedgehogs, mm -hmm. um, some tissue specimens from batch hedgehogs, bats, hedgehogs, shrews, and a wide variety of rodents like deer mice and so forth. 15,000 samples. And he tested them all in a um, PCR assay specific for HAV RNA. And he found about 150 samples positive. Mm -hmm. And from those, he was able to clone out uh, something like 10 unique hepatovirus mm -hmm. genomes. Mm -hmm. So that was reported in a paper we had in PNAS. Yeah, we did that on this Twitter. Fall. You did? I didn't know in that. In fact, Steve Bockenheimer, your colleague, uh -huh. <clears throat> apparently listens to Twitter. He said, you have to do this paper. He, oh, I thought, yeah. he emailed it, and I looked at it and said, wow, it's the first time we get some clue for almost any picorna, where it came from. Well, right? it's interesting because <laughs> hepatitis A disappears from small communities. Yeah. So like in Greenland, or in small islands in the Pacific, if the if the uh, population is isolated and small, right, and there's not sufficient numbers to maintain uh -huh. uh, transmission, a transmission cycle, it just disappears. Right. So the island of Panape, a very famous situation where it disappeared and there was no hepatitis on the island. There were several surveys done. No one under the age of 20 had antibody. And then I think a cruise ship arrived <laughs> and everyone under 20 got hepatitis A. Right. Um, so you wonder how a, how a virus like that could evolve. Right. And of course, this is a virus that's different than other coronaviruses, both in its genome organization, mm -hmm. uh, but also in its capsid structure. 
Um, another really interesting paper was published in Nature, uh, I guess early last year, was the structure of hepatitis A from right. Liz Fry and Dave Stewart. Right, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, so this virus has a capsid structure that's sort of intermediate between other mammalian picornaviruses mm -hmm. and uh, the insect dicistroviruses, right. cricket paralysis mm -hmm. virus. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a throwback. Mm. And, and that's kind of interesting because it suggests the possibility of an insect origin, ultimately. Right, right. And the ancestral reconstructions that Felix did uh, suggested that all hepatitis A probably ultimately came from a bat origin. Mm -hmm. And these bats, of course, could be insectivores. And, um, and, and bats explains the evolution because they, they roost right. in colonies of hundreds of thousands. Right. And the rodent may have been an intermediate host yeah, uh, exactly. towards humans as well. Yeah, I remember that paper very well. Speaking of the structure, I have to show you here on my desk. You would appreciate this. This is I have a model of polio here, uh -huh. um, which Ann Palmenberg gave me. This is quite old because all the protomers are hand-colored, but inside is the genome in the form of a beaded molecule where every bead is the right color. Right size. Wow. And There's a lot right of space size. in there. Yeah, but I think it's close to the right size. Huh. But the, you see the three prime end that you have there is the poly A tail. So A is red. Uh -huh. each, okay. each of the four nucleotides is a different color. And she beaded it to the right sequence of polio. No kidding. 7,442 wow. bases. Yeah. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That is really cool. <laughs> so she did it for um, rhinovirus years ago. Uh -huh. And when I visited her a couple of years ago, I said, boy, I'd love to have one. For polio, and then a few years later, one arrived in my mail, and she had huh. done it. She just told me she did it during the World Cup. Huh. She was bored. <laughs> that's amazing, and that's, that's a beautiful. great teaching tool. You get great gifts when you go to give seminars. You know, got this, and you got yeah, the glass virus, yeah, the glass. And look at yeah. uh, the, there's on my shelf there. You'll notice there's a cowbell. Yeah, I got that at Mississippi State. Very cool. they're, uh, they all go to the football games and they ring a cowbell. Yeah. So instead of giving me a plaque, they put the plaque on a cowbell. And they asked me to ring it before my seminar. That's pretty neat. So you've done a couple of neat things with Hep A that I wanted to touch on. And I think you first discovered this Cree element in the Hep A genome. Mm, is that correct? Yeah, the cis-acting right. replication element. Right. Yeah. Which is now we know to be the site for um, uridylation of VPG, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It templates that uridylation in a slide-back mechanism, as, as Eckhard Wimmer showed. So you found it first in Hep A, then you found it in rhinovirus. We found right? it in rhinovirus first. And we didn't find rhino it in Hep A for a long time. We looked for it. Okay, so first was Rhino. Yeah, so the story with Rhino was um, Kevin McKnight, who's actually in my lab now still, after spending some time at Lilly. Uh, Kevin was a graduate student. Mm -hmm. Who I and, met, I remember, years ago. Yeah. And I had, a, um, I had a small pilot grant from the Cystic Fibrosis Center at UNC back in the uh, 90s, mid-90s. And the idea was to use polio these rhinovirus, excuse me, mm -hmm. to express the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance protein, right, right. CFTR. And um, so it was, you know, simple. Take rhino, cut out the capsid, right. put in CFTR, and the damn thing didn't replicate mm. as RNA, you know. If so, you did that with polio, it would. It would have replicated perfectly. Because in fact, my postdoc, Gerardo yeah. Kaplan, in my lab, what he had done is to cut out the polio capsid and just yeah. take the rest and it replicated very well right yep. and yep. you knew that when you were doing we knew it, it so it should work yeah. so here are these viruses that are so <laughs> similar okay and uh you know to many to, to to kevin's credit um he wanted to figure out why right a lot of people might just say well that just work. didn't work it. you know uh so he was able to nail down uh this small segment uh i think it was in vp1 if i remember right uh, near the amino terminus of vp1 um, that had this stem loop we could mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And we showed that the RNA was important. It didn't have to be translated. The structure was important. And it had those three A's on right. the five prime side of the loop. Right. Uh, and so we called it a cis-acting replication element. Cree. Cree. At the time, you didn't know it was involved in VPG uridylation. No, we had no idea what it was doing. Just we just knew that here was a part of the RNA that was required for RNA replication, that, you know, that the RNA was bifunctional, both translating and acting as yeah. RNA, which is kind of cool. And then after you published that, it was quickly discovered in other viral in, Yeah, right? Yeah, and for a long time we looked for it in hepatitis A, and we never could find it until uh, Peter Simmons came up with a, uh, a new method for looking at the frequency of non-synonymous mm -hmm. substitutions in HAV genomes. And he found this region of high structural conservation 
mm-hmm. uh, down in the polymerase region. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a big stem loop there with and multiple A's, and that's it. So that published that maybe five years ago. And in polio, it's in two, the 2C protein yeah. coding region. So it can be anywhere. And and Kevin showed that. Kevin showed you could move it around. You could put it in the 3' prime UTR. You could put it right. up in the 5' prime UTR, I think. So its position wasn't important. It just had to be there. So did ultimately he get the CF, CFTR? CTFR, I don't remember. Well, the cystic fibrosis gene. CFTR, did he ever? Did he get? No, that to we work? found this much more interesting. Yeah, of <laughs> it's a great example of serendipity, right? Yeah, you start but to do something, and as someone once said, you know, you, to succeed in in science, you have to work hard, and you have to be lucky. Yep, and you have to be smart enough to know when you're lucky. Absolutely, and, and I think Kevin was. You know, I think those three things are really important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you can't just be lucky. You have to have a few other skills. Right? Yeah. But as Pasteur or someone said, luck favors the prepared mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I, I always found that a really interesting uh, discovery. And of course, I think it was Wimmer who later showed that it was the site for uridylation yep. of VPG. Yep. So VPG is the primer for RNA synthesis. And it, first you have to add two U's onto it to serve as a primer. And that's what mm-hmm. is done. So is it the primer... Um, I, I suppose, does it work in both the plus and the minus? Uh, My strain? understanding is that it does, yeah. Yeah, interesting. The other observation with Hepe, and these are just a few of the many, uh, is, which we talked about in the other TWIV, that sometimes the virus particle is enveloped. So these are naked picornaviruses, right? So how does a naked virus get out of a cell? How does a virus without a membrane get out of a cell, Vince? Well, you know. traditionally, we're taught that the cell breaks open, Yeah, right? but this is a virus that's not cytopathic. It's not cytopathic. And probably polio also is not cytopathic in vivo in many cells. I think, actually, there aren't there in vitro infections with polio? Didn't Vadim Agol have in rhabdomyosarcoma yeah. cells? Yeah, uh, there's some, there are yeah. many cells. Of course, in HeLa cells, polio wipes them out. Yeah. Does, does Hep A wipe out HeLa cells? Or does it doesn't no. do anything? No, it, it, it barely anything. replicates, but it, it can be adapted to replicate in HeLa cells. Yeah. Well... I have to tell you some of our polio results afterwards. Uh, I don't want them so, re- so recorded. So what we think, but, though, with, but, the, with the envelope is that we think this is the way the virus exits cells, period. So, so is that what you were thinking initially, that this virus is non-cytopathic? Let's figure out how to... No. No. <laughs> it's, that's too straightforward and linear, right? <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it's, it's, again, you know, where, where you get an oblique angle that, that, that leads you somewhere else. Uh, we were interested in the innate immune response mm-hmm. to hep A, uh, which is very different than hep C. Uh, so both of these viruses, hep A and hep C, they both express proteases that cleave MAVs and TRIF. So not caspases being induced, but they actually express proteases. And in the case of hepatitis A, it's the precursor protease 3ABC mm-hmm. that has a transmembrane domain in 3A that carries it to the mitochondrial membrane where it cleaves MAVs. Mm-hmm. And TRIF is cleaved, this is the TLR3 adapter, is cleaved by 3CD. Um, if you take the polymerase off the mm-hmm. back of the protease, its, it's protease specificity changes and it no right. longer cleaves. So um, both viruses target these same adapters in the innate immune response. Uh, and yet hepatitis C infections, there is robust expression right. of interferon-stimulated gene transcripts mm-hmm. in the liver. And in hepatitis A, there's virtually none. Hmm. Uh, so, um, Frank Chisari had shown at that time that plasma cytoid dendritic cells mm-hmm. responded to hep C replicons, uh, replicon bearing cells, by virtue of exosomes being released from the cells containing viral RNA. Huh. So, it wasn't virus, okay, it was exosomes. Right. <laughs> so, we wanted to see the same thing if this would work with hepatitis A. Right. It was an obvious question. So, Zhang Di Feng, who was in the lab then, was making exosome preps from hepatitis A infected cells. Mm. And so you look at them by EM, we looked at them by EM, and you know, there are these viral particles, these capsids right. sitting in these membranes. Inside the membrane, but yeah. inside the exosome. Yeah. Is it just one or is it multiple capsids? You have, there, there's either one or occasionally two, uh, and even three or four occasionally. Um, most of these have probably one or two. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- the other thing that helped us probably with this is that we were using HU7 cells mm-hmm. at that time, and we were working with a low-passage P16 right. non-cytopathic variant. So in the HU7 cells, it grows well, um, but there's not much cell death. Uh, and um, what we had been doing previously was working with um, BSC1 cells or African green monkey kidney cells mm-hmm. to grow the virus. And, of course, we'd make a virus prep. And how do you make a virus prep? 
you know, you have to detergent, bust the cells with a detergent to get the virus out. We knew it was heavily cell associated. So mm. we were destroying these. Right, right. I actually have a paper, hmm. a paper published in the Journal of Clinical, no, the Journal of General Virology around 1994, in which we were making a case that the virus is released from cells heavily associated with membranes. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to get a clean neutralization assay and remove the residual non-neutralized component, mm. you had to chloroform extract gets the sample. Rid, gets rid of the membranes, right? It doesn't, uh, actually, it doesn't get rid of the membranes. Mm -hmm. What happens is the membrane-bound virus Go into the goes chloroform. into the organic phase. So you get rid of it. You yeah. get rid of it, you lose it. Not, it's not destroying it. You could do the same with detergent, I guess, and, and maintain those particles. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so now we know if we take, mm -hmm. if we are really careful with the culture and the cells are in really good shape, all of the detectable virus, almost all of the detectable virus in the supernatant is enveloped. And whereas in mm. our paper in Nature, we had the second peak. Right, right. I think that was coming largely from cells dying in the culture uh -huh. or yeah, some of these envelope particles busting Got open. It. Got it. So you think now in every infected cell, they're, they're making envelope yeah. HIV. Because I remember the original idea was that maybe the liver is just making this so to shield the virus in the blood. And well, cell so culture. I, I think that's happening. Because if you, if you look at the blood in humans, and we mm -hmm. had the opportunity to do that with some acute phase serum we got from Korea, all the virus you can detect in the blood is enveloped, mm -hmm. both uh, in um, uh, people and also in chimpanzees, which is the classic model. And the virus in the feces is not. Huh. So the virus in the feces is being replicated in the liver because right. there's probably not an enteric source for that. And so it has to traverse the biliary tract. Mm -hmm. And, and of the course, the membrane's taken away. Bile salts were yeah. the way you used to tell the difference between an enveloped and a non enveloped virus. Right. <laughs> so, so, this works not only for hepatitis A, but also hepatitis E. Mm -hmm. It's a very similar phenomena. Mm -hmm. They're enveloped as well. They're enveloped and of in course, the blood. Subsequently, others have shown that polioviruses can also be produced in enveloped forms, right? Yeah, I think the mechanism is different. Different, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's also very interesting work. And and those those membranes uh, with Coxsackie, I think the work was done largely at, at NIH, um, they contain many, many particles right. of virus. So their theory was that this is because most genomes are defective and you need to have many in an envelope, a bag of viruses to infect the cell, but I'm not so sure about that. I'm not that. sure of that. Yeah. yeah. I think that an individual particle, we know from the... Uh, single hit kinetics of yeah. infection that you just need one, right? Right. So I'm not so sure about need that. Need one lucky particle. That's right. Now for polio, the particle, the PFU can be a thousand mm -hmm. to one. So a lot of them are defective, but one will work. Either fact. they're defective or, you know, I've often thought they just don't get where they have to be. Yeah. I think that's part of it. They as don't well. find a receptor or they, right. you know. They could stop somewhere. It, it, the replication cycle is complicated. So if you fail at any one mm -hmm. step, it's over. Right. You, have to, you have to pass through all of them. Now, the presence of an envelope on Hep A, you suggested would shield it from an antibody response, yeah. and you showed that yeah. as well. So why does the vaccine work? <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> because you're presumably, but you are presumably acquiring fecal virus, so that doesn't have an envelope, right? Yeah, but... Um that's that's certainly true. You're acquiring the enveloped, the non-enveloped virus in a natural infection. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the um, uh, the the vaccine or immune globulin, because the antibody is the active component, largely in protecting uh, an individual against mm -hmm. hepatitis A, uh, will work if you give it after the infection. So after mm -hmm. the virus is in the liver, I see. After it's already producing an mm -hmm. enveloped virus, it works. So how does how does this possibly work? Well. We think that the uh, enveloped particle, and it, it's probably more appropriate to call it quasi-enveloped mm -hmm, than enveloped, right, because right. there's no viral peplomers on the surface right. of that membrane. It's just right. a cell membrane, like an exosomal membrane. Uh, we think it gets taken up through an endosomal pathway. It takes mm -hmm. a long time to infect a cell by that pathway compared to the naked particle that binds to its receptor on the plasma mm -hmm. membrane and goes mm -hmm. right in. So we did a series of experiments that are in that paper in Nature a couple of years ago where we um, infected cells, um, washed off the inoculum. Mm -hmm. We waited then one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, and added antibody. And up to four or five hours afterwards, the addition of antibody would block 
the replication of the virus in those cells. Mm -hmm. And so what we think is happening is that the virus gets taken up, the antibody gets taken up along with the virus in an endosomal compartment, mm -hmm. or maybe they get taken up separately, but they both end up yeah. in a late endosomal lysosomal compartment. And it's in that compartment that the membrane has taken off the virus. So as the membrane comes off the virus, the virus can then find its receptor. And the TIM1 receptor right. that Gerardo discovered, right. it, it traffics to the endosome and the lysosome. Um, hmm. uh, or if there's antibody there, it can bind capsid right. and prevent right. that, probably by locking the capsid. So it's an intracellular neutralization. So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, post-endocytic yeah. neutralization, but it's outside the cytoplasm. I mean, whether you consider right. the right. endosomal lumen intracellular or not. Yeah, it's 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 so this was yeah. this was a major sticking point with the reviews in the paper. They mm. were saying, well, you know, reviewers were saying, one of them in particular was unhappy with the fact that we were making a case for this in the paper because he thought or she thought just finding the envelope particles was enough. Why do you have to claim this also? You know, but I thought we had to explain how the vaccine might work to make it credible. Mm -hmm. So um we found one antibody, it was an IgM monoclonal that was a potent neutralizer of the naked particles extracellularly it had no ability to neutralize mm. in this fashion at interesting. all. Interesting. Because the IgM <laughs> probably comes apart yeah, sure. in the lysosomal compartment. You know, it's interesting. If you knew this about hep A, that it was enveloped, before you made a vaccine, you might not make a vaccine. Absolutely. Say, you would yeah. say, ah, this can't work, right? Or, or here we have a vaccine that we have thought for years works by neutralizing virus in the blood. Yeah, and it's and not it doesn't. working that way. Yeah. It's so, really interesting. So you said... So we, uh, other picornas probably do this. You said hepi, which is a different... Hepi is not a picornavirus, It's a different course. family. It's right? a different family, a uh, hepi viridae. Um, and Zhang Difeng, who's now at Nationwide with Chris Walker as an assistant professor, has some really nice data that's now, I think, in press or almost there showing the same phenomena with hepi. This works in a similar fashion. Any other viruses known to do this? Uh, well, there may be other viruses that do that haven't been studied. Found I mean, yeah. Ebola enters through the same compartment. Right. Um, pox viruses have this real complex system of multiple envelopes. Mm. Uh, I, I don't understand. Yes, it's uh, complex, as we call it. I <laughs> <laughs> don't understand it. Well, the, the idea is that these viruses that are enveloped, they're not quasi-enveloped, as you say. Yeah. Because they have a, the envelope is actually part of the maturation process. It's associated right. with viral proteins. Yeah. This is different. Well, HEPI I mean, has, is also probably quasi-enveloped. Mm -hmm. um, there's some evidence that one of the ORFs produces a protein that's on the membrane, but I think the preponderance of evidence would be against that. Mm -hmm. And both of the viruses seem to have um, late domains in their structural program yeah. proteins yeah. that target, uh, you know, escort components. Right. So actually, um, I did your... You had a paper where you discussed the escort pathway with respect to the HEPA envelope yeah. particles. It was a PNAS paper, I think. Is that right? Uh, we had a... Uh, it was, that wasn't part of your nature paper. It was in the nature was paper. It? We had the knockdowns. So I, I teach a, a virology uh, lecture at Rockefeller, and we, we assigned, I assigned that as a discussion for the students afterwards. They were very intrigued. It yeah. stimulated a lot of discussion. And Paul Nash was there, who was a, who was a TSG... 101 guy, yeah. right, and all that stuff. He was very interested in it. Yeah. Um, but exosomes are part of the normal cell biology of a cell without viruses. There's a right. whole, you know, they, they carry out small RNAs and they bind to cells and deliver them, right? Yeah. So this is just tapping into that. So if you think of a virus having a clever strategy, here's a virus that uses the escort system and exosomes uh, to get out of the cell. It dumps it into the bloodstream. So now it's in an exosome. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the body doesn't see it. The B cells don't see it. There's no right. no antigen recognition or any stimulation of the B cell response for three to four weeks until there's some death in hepatocytes and some antigen gets released. I see. And that's where you eventually get a resolving immune yeah. response. So the virus can spread um, around the liver um, yeah. and it's it, without worrying about antibody. At the same time as it's being shunted out through the biliary tract to the gut, yeah, right. it loses this envelope huh. and it's highly stable once it's lost the envelope. So the, the cell death in hepatocytes, you said, is immune mediated. We think it's innate immune mediated. Because you would think that the virus could evolve to, to be completely not cytopathic so it would avoid being neutralized. But and it has. It does, it's not cytopathic at all. It's actually our immune yeah. response that, it, that eventually... But sooner or later, the innate immune response, you know, through recognition of double-stranded RNA probably, um, through a Rig-I MDA5 pathway recognizes infection. And that 
uh, initiates a cascade of events leading to Earth-3 phosphorylation, mm -hmm. and we think that leads to Puma and Noxa mm -hmm. transcription and destabilization of the mitochondrial membrane and mitochondrial apoptosis. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, there is then secondary recruitment. Um, we see very high levels of Rantes being expressed mm -hmm. in our mouse model, uh, probably also Earth-3 mediated. And that's bringing in NK cells, um, mm -hmm. CD4, CD8 cells. So do you know, you may remember a number of years ago, Charlie Rice and John Shoggins did yeah. this ISG screen right. of many viruses. Was Hep A part of that screen? I don't think they did. They, it, they had hepatitis A, but I don't think, I don't yeah. remember that being part of it. The question is, when you treat cells with interferon, you turn on mm -hmm. the production of many ISGs, interferon-stimulated genes. Do you know which inhibit Hep A? I don't. I've never, we've never looked at that. Yeah. You know. Has anyone? No, but nobody's done that, right? I don't think so. Presumably there are some that would be inhibitory to steps of replication, right? I'm sure there are. Yeah. yeah. Do you, are you continuing with envelope mechanisms of yeah, envelope? Yeah, so we're, we're looking okay. at um, uh, signals mm -hmm. in the virion. I'll talk about some of this today that we think are important for mm -hmm. recruitment to the escort apparatus. Uh, we've been looking at the protein composition of this membrane by mm -hmm. SILAC proteomics, uh, which is looking like an exosomal membrane, right. many of the same protein. Right, right. Um, and so that's that's where that focus is going uh, for the most part. Yeah, I, I think this is great work. I, I called it seminal uh, when I first saw it. It's, it's brand new. It's It's changing the way we think about viruses, and that's what we like. Yeah, it was fun at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really it was a fun, fun paper to write, you know. Sure, I'm sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about Hep C, which is a very different animal. Mm -hmm. Now, you've, you continue to work on Hep C as well, yeah. right? Yep. Now, this, we now have antivirals, which are very good. Excellent. For treating, right? Yeah. So, we'll, we'll Why eat, work on it still? No, no, I don't want to ask <laughs> you that because it's always important to work on a virus. Mm -hmm. My virus, we can't work on soon, right? Polio, in fact. Type 2 has been eradicated, right. and I've been told by CDC to get rid of my type 2 stocks. And they're, any day now, we have to autoclave them. Yeah, And yeah. Uh, those are the wild type virus. And then in July, I think, we have to get rid of the Sabin stocks. And I, I don't know if someone's going to keep some somewhere, right? Because we might need them for research. <laughs> now, are they targeting these announcements to polio, recognize polio virologists? Yeah, of course, or, uh, of course. They say there are about 140 labs in the U.S. that have declared that they have polio viruses. Uh -huh. And most of them have type 1. We, in fact, have every one. I've got collections yeah. of different serotypes all over the place. And a lot of, we used to do a lot of work on type 2, so we have to get rid of them. But um, So we have Sabin strains. And you know, we have Sabin strains with yeah. the base sequences stuck in them. Oh. Eventually, they all have to go. So type yeah. 3 will be next because there hasn't been a case for a couple of years. And then type 1, who knows when, because those, that's the one that's persisting. Then you right have now. these high-path vaccine-derived strains still out there circulating, right? Yeah, that's a problem. You know, you know what's going to happen in uh, April. There's going to be a synchronized switch from trivalent to bivalent OPV to uh -huh. get rid of the type 2, because a lot of the cases of type 2 polio are vaccine-derived, yeah. right? I just don't know how long it will circulate, these vaccine-derived strains, because, you know, every day after you mm -hmm. draw type 2, more and more kids will be born that aren't immune. Yeah. Yep. Are you going to have an outbreak? And if you do, wh what are you going to do? WHO wants countries to introduce uh, IPV into yeah. their schedule, but not every country can afford it. Right? Well, it's it's quite amazing, you know, when we were in Geneva together many yeah, years this, ago. This, this harkens kind back of to stuff that. we were talking about, all right? <laughs> right. And, and even now, you know, the end game is not clear as far as I'm concerned. Nope, it's not at all. I mean, it's great that we've reached this point. When you and I were, so you and I were on the WHO steering committee for Hep A polio, yeah. right? And we were always talking about eradication, but at the time there were lots and lots of polio cases, tens of thousands, and now we have less than 100 yeah. a year, which is, yeah. in India, can you believe India is now polio-free? Yeah. Remember, we always thought this would be a problem. Anyway, the hep C question is that, do you think use, the use of these antivirals will eliminate infection globally? Because there's no animal reservoir of hep C, is that correct? No, there's no animal reservoir, uh, but I, I don't, and I'm not sanguine about the likelihood that these drugs are going to eliminate the mm -hmm. infection for a number of reasons. Uh, one is most individuals with the infection don't know they're infected. Mm. In the U.S., even only 50% of infected people know they're infected. And they still transmit it. And they yeah. still can transmit it. And, and after you have been uh, infected and treated successfully, you can get reinfected. There's no vaccine. Right. And 
uh, very little effort going towards development of a vaccine. And I think uh, now that Francis Collins has basically uh, led the NIH in a direction that prohibits the use of chimpanzees mm-hmm. in biomedical, invasive biomedical research for justifiable reasons, I think, uh, in some ways, yeah. um, you know, the likelihood we're going to get a vaccine for hepatitis C is, is minimal. Mm-hmm. So the only way the drugs would work is if everyone who was infected took them and and you eliminated virus so there would be no more reinfections. So you get no more reinfections or that everyone um, changed their lifestyle completely yeah, right. after they were cured of the infection. Hmm. The drugs are excellent and, and there's now multiple regimens. Uh, Merck's regimen was just approved last week. What is that? Uh, it's a regimen of a 5A inhibitor and a protease inhibitor. So Elbisvir no, and Gresaprovir. No more interferon, right? No more interferon. So both there's three companies out there now with totally interferon sparing Mm-hmm. combinations of drugs, anywhere from two to five drugs in some of these combinations. Um, and if you go to the liver meetings now, it's really quite boring <laughs> because uh, if they don't get at least 95% cure rate mm-hmm. after no more than eight to 12 weeks therapy with a single pill a day, right. it's just not cutting edge anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the old days where it was a year of interferon, yeah. you know, with 17% cure rate. So it's come a long, long way. Mm. And a lot of virology has been learned in the process. But the key here is that long-term infection with hep C can lead to liver, liver cancer, yeah. right? So this is why you don't yeah. want to be infected for a long period of time. And even, you know, eliminating the virus infection with uh, a drug combination doesn't eliminate the possibility of liver cancer. Uh, mm-hmm. There is a residual risk, mm. uh, and we don't know how long that risk will last. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things my lab has been interested in the past is the mechanism by which the virus causes cancer. Mm. And you know, the facile answer is that it's all immunopathologic. Right, right. Um, but if you look at hepatitis B-associated liver cancer and hepatitis C-associated mm-hmm. liver cancer, they're very different diseases. Uh, different uh, uh, at the genetic and molecular level in the cell. Uh, and to some extent in their clinical presentation, of mm-hmm. course. Uh, and there's evidence, I think, from C, uh, that the virus is actually actively disrupting retinoblastoma signaling ah. and probably also P53 signaling, something mm-hmm. we're working on now. That would be interesting, a specific yeah. mechanism, not just tissue damage and healing and damage and healing. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Right. So so we, we we published many years ago, 10 years ago now, that the polymerase of hepatitis C mm-hmm has an LXCXE motif mm-hmm. right near the active site that binds RB. Mm-hmm. So only about 10% of the polymerase is actually involved in the replication complex, and the other 90%, according mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. Rob Barton's log, is floating around in the cytoplasm. Mm. Uh, so it, it, it binds RB, and our work showed at the time that it recruits E6-associated protein, which is an E3 ligase, mm-hmm. uh, to RB. Uh, it ubiquitilates it, and it's degraded by the proteasome. So in infected cells in vitro, you can see a degradation and disappearance of RB. Mm. And, you know, how would the virus want to do that? Not to cause cancer, certainly. But, no. You mm. know, if you look at uh, mice that have acute ablation of RB expression, right. about a third of the proteins that are involved are actually proteins in the innate immune system. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of crosstalk between RB, P53, and these cell cycle regulatory pathways and innate immune Mm-hmm. Uh, response pathways. So my guess is that's why that's the virus why, may okay. be doing it. And and RB, of course, is a key player in mm-hmm. preventing cells from replicating forever and developing into tumors. And, and it's key in, in uh, the DNA damage response. Right. And so the way we have looked at this, and I hate to say it because everyone sort of rolls their eyes, is it's probably um, uh, sort of hit and run, mm-hmm. the old hit and run um, uh, fl- um, paradigm, right. where the virus infects an hepatocyte it knocks down RB through this process so that the RB pathway is attenuated. And this is in a liver that has a lot of ongoing inflammation with a lot of oxidative stress so that there is oxidative DNA damage in that mm-hmm. cell. And now the cell is unable to respond to that oxidative damage as effectively right. Right. Uh, as before its genome mm-hmm. is less protected. So is this a major hep C focus of your lab? It, it has been. Uh, we're working now on... Um, uh, what we think is a mechanism by which hep C dysregulates uh, P53 mm-hmm. function in infected cells. Mm. Also so could be involved in cancer, right? Also could yeah. be involved in cancer and probably evolve for similar reasons. 
Um, mm-hmm. But the, the, most of the work over the past few years has been focused on mechanisms underlying MIR-122. Right, which I wanted to end up with to talk a little bit about. the. You discovered that, you and Sarno, I guess, discovered that MIR-122, yeah. is it? MIR-122. Binds to the five pri- the iris of hep C and is needed, It binds right? upstream of the iris. Upstream. It's two sites upstream of the iris right near the extreme five prime end mm-hmm. uh, that Peter and I, in collaborative work about 10 years ago, uh, identified and, and showed in a genotype 1A system that the binding of MIR-122 mm-hmm. to those two sites is essential for amplification of the genome. MIR-122 is one of the most abundant microRNAs in the liver, and it's liver-specific. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we've been very curious as to why. Right. You know, so it, right. it's acting in a completely non-canonical fashion for a microRNA, because you know, microRNAs usually target sites in the three-prime non-translator right. region of messages. Right. And they destabilize the message and block its translation. So here we're binding the five prime end, and our work has shown that MIR-122 binding to the five prime end of the viral genome stabilizes the right. viral genome by blocking, preventing um, degradation mediated by the five prime exonuclease XRN1. Hmm. And then very recently, we've shown that it also has a second, completely independent mechanism that uh, uh, relates to a stimulation in viral RNA synthesis. And we can show that mm-hmm. you take cells that are infected mm-hmm. with the virus and replicating the viral RNA, and we chuck in additional MIR-122. Within an hour, we get a marked two-fold upregulation mm-hmm. of RNA synthesis measured by a metabolic labeling assay. Right. Not related to degradation at all. Not related right. to degradation, because we'll do this in cells that are knocked out for XRN uh, right. knocked down, so there's no stabilizing yes. effect. I think we did that paper too on TWIV, or because re- yeah. you had you had published something about uh, XRN knockouts. You may have most papers discussed on TWIV. Well, I, I ought to check. I ought to get a list of numbers. Yeah, because uh, these are all ringing bells. Well, I, I love picornas. You know, I, yeah. I tend to be uh, uh, biased towards them. I try and spread it out because there's more virology than picorna virus. Hep C is not that far away. Hep C is very close, but your work is all really interesting, as I said at the top, so it merits inclusion. So there are two mechanisms. One, the MIR-122 prevents degradation, yeah. and the other is somehow it's stimulating RNA synthesis. Yeah. Is there any other virus for which a MIR is needed for replication that you know of? Nothing that uh, acts uh, in this kind of fashion. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, the herpes viruses all make microRNAs. Right. And so they're, right. But I, my sense there is that what those that microRNAs are doing is regulating the cellular homeostasis in some way favorable to the virus. And, and here it's a right. direct interaction. Now, um, a, a, a drug that blocks MIR-122 has been developed. At yeah, a couple, anti- a couple of different drugs. Yeah. But where are these at? At what point? Well, so Miravirsin was the first. Right. So it's an antagomer, uh, locked nucleic acid antagomer of microRNA-122. And it went into phase two clinical trials. Mm-hmm. The uh, company that was developing, it was a Danish company. It got bought out by one of the big pharma companies. And I think they dropped that program. Yeah. Uh, but the, Regulus, the, Regulus the, Therapeutics, though, in uh, California, has a uh, Galnac targeted form of Amir-122 antagomer that's taken up very rapidly and efficiently by the liver. Mm-hmm. And uh, one dose of this compound, uh, and in many patients, the virus disappears for weeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think they have some patients now uh, a, a minor number of patients in their phase phase two trial that remain virus negative, mm-hmm. uh, like a year and a half out. Wow, that's so, one dose. Uh, one dose. Is that better than the antivirals? Oh yeah, because uh. just one dose. Yeah. You know, so um, I think there's there's some thought that maybe you could pair that with a long acting conventional antiviral, right? And maybe you could come up with a single shot cure, right? Which would be that'd remarkable. Right? That would be remarkable, yeah. particularly in parts of the world that are having trouble affording the current uh, They're rather regimes. expensive, aren't they? Yeah. On the other hand, you know, if, if you look at mice that are knocked out from MIR-122, right. they develop liver cancer. And MIR-122 has some um, tumor promotion activity and makes mm-hmm. a, it makes a differentiated hepatocyte a differentiated hepatocyte. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think it's problematic to antagonize that pathway right. in a patient that's already at risk for liver cancer. I see. So, I mean, yeah. it, may, it may work fine, and it yeah, may not yeah. cause any additional burden, but very hard to prove. 
long-term studies would only tell us that, right? Once yeah. it's licensed and put in a lot of people. But the idea would be that given one dose, maybe it's okay. Yeah. I mean, right. if you prevent replication, you're going to eliminate inflammation yeah. all the time. So that's going to have a positive effect. So you think eventually these antagomeres or antagonizing one to two will, will be well, part I, of the Well, I, uh, I sort of thought that they were, you know, a dead issue when Miraversin came yeah. to its end. Uh, but this new um, specifically targeted version seems pretty impressive. Mm. And, and to get, uh, you know, high level suppression with a single dose. Yeah, it's neat. And, and you don't get resistance to this at all. If, if the target sequence in the genome changed to prevent uh, binding, uh, well, wait, we're blocking the antagomere, so resistance is not going to be an issue, right? Well, what you're doing is you're, you're um, sequestering yeah, MIR-122, yeah. so it's yeah. not present. But the virus, you know, might be able to adapt to, to another something else, small yeah. RNA. So there are uh, MIR-122 um, less dependent genomes that are available. Mm. Um, Jens Buch found a really interesting one that he was able to select out with replicon cells under pressure. Mm -hmm. pressure, if I remember right. And the genome had a, uh, as I recall, it had a snow RNA sequence tacked onto its five prime end. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. I mean, it replicated. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's very interesting stuff. Um, you've done a lot of neat things. Is there anything you think is really cool that we didn't cover? No, oh, those are the cool things. We have you've, you've done a lot with antagonism of innate responses in both HEP A and C, which you kind of alluded to earlier. Yeah. Which I think, I think you were in the beginning of the whole field of antagonism of innate immunity, right? Uh, well, the work uh, that Mike Gale and I did together, mm -hmm. I mean, together we um, discovered that the NS3 protease was blocking of uh, interferon responses. Right. Uh, of course, that was before MAVS was discovered, before RIGI was discovered. So, uh, yeah, and, and Mike and I still collaborate. We share an NIH pilot award together uh, in our... Mm -hmm. uh, um, innate immune control of virus infections so center. He, he was at, uh, in Galveston? Or he, he was, was, no, he was at Texas, right? Texas Southwestern uh, and, and you, in, in you, Dallas. And that's when you collaborated? Yeah, we were collaborating then, yeah. Is that, far, is that close enough to Galveston? That you yeah, it's a couple hundred miles. And in Texas, you know, that's nothing, right? It's nothing, right? <laughs> a morning drive. <laughs> An hour on Southwestern. And then he moved to And he Seattle. moved to the University of Washington in Seattle, where he still is. Yeah. Right. And he's done some amazing work. I'm looking forward to your talk, Stan. Well, you've probably heard 90% of it now. Well, know. that's right. The but you'll audience, hear some of the details. The audience uh, will not have heard it. So thanks for talking with me today. I really uh, appreciate pleasure. it. You can find TWIV at iTunes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. We're also at Google Play Music, Stitcher Radio, and anywhere fine and free podcasts are distributed using your favorite podcast catcher, for example. And we do love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twiv at microbe.tv. My guest today has been Stan Lemon from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv. It's viral. <laughs> <laughs>